If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. Star Baby, when did you first become interested in aviation? Holy cow, right into it. Okay, so I first became interested in aviation, I think, in when I was around eight years old, maybe seven, when I moved to New Zealand, because that's the first, you know, long flights I remember. But also at the time, New Zealand was kind of aviation. I don't want to say crazy, but there was definitely a lot of aviation interest still left over from the Second World War. And so we actually had war comics. This was a 1970s thing where we had black and white war comics were a big thing among the, you know, nine year old, eight year old set. And I liked the ones that were mostly about, you know, aviation events. Um, and so that was pretty much it. I mean, I was the kind of kid that when we were on a trans Pacific flight, if we hit turbulence, I'd be running up and down the aisles. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into your um, Air Force career. So when did you actually join the U.S. Air Force? So I had a four-year ROTC scholarship, so I signed on the dotted line in the fall of 1984, um, and then I was commissioned in May of 1988 and went on active duty in November of 88. Nice one. And did you always want to be a backseater, a nav, whistle, all that kind of stuff, Ewu, Ewu? Not necessarily. I mean, I started out wanting to fly fighters, and I mean, that was young. That was before I was 10. Uh, and, you know, at the time, the Phantom was a big deal. And in college, I got a NAV scholarship, which helped me along there. And I was offered a pilot slot, but I turned it down. Okay. Because it didn't pay for college. Hmm. Because even then, I was beginning to focus on the electronic warfare part, the EWO. That looked really, really interesting, uh, F4G and EF-111. And so front seaters didn't do that. Uh, so I ended up, I think, focusing more on the back because it seemed to be where the cool stuff was happening. And the smarter people, obviously. Well, that's actually true. Yes, it's true. <laughs> uh, there, there are psychological differences between the front and the back seats. Um, there have to be. Of course, yeah. So what aircraft did you start uh, your basic training on? The T-37. In specialized undergraduate navigator training, we fly the T-37, which is a twin-engine Cessna dating from the 50s. Noisy, highly maneuverable, ridiculously fast G onset rate. And in nav school, your aircraft are the T-37 and the T-43, which is a 737-200 with a navigational radar and 12 student stations in the back. It's called a Gator. So how do you find operating them aircraft? So they definitely let you operate the T-37 because that was kind of the point. And it was just simply too cool. I mean, you were in a jet. Uh, you know, it was highly maneuverable. You were able to do fun things for it because it's a trainer. You're going to learn to do acrobatics. You're going to do something that looks like low altitude navigation that isn't that low. The T-43, of course, we were allowed on the flight deck to watch the pilots, but no nav student ever goes and takes the controls of a 737. Uh, we just tell the pilots what uh, we want them to do during the portion of the flight when, you know, where the controlling nav. Because with 12 guys, it's not like you have a cage match in the back to decide who is going to actually navigate the aircraft at the time. You've got a specified number of legs where you're the primary guy. Mm -hmm. So going through your training, uh, did you know what aircraft type you wanted to go on to? And were you, because the, the EF-111 there as well, wasn't there? There was, and I was, I think, focusing on Phantoms. Now, I don't remember this, but a friend of mine, John Gala, uh, who went to fly Strike Eagles and is now a cardiac surgeon. No, oh, wow. <laughs> he recalls that on the first day of nav school, I got up and said, I'm going to walk out of here with an F4G wild weasel. And I don't remember that, but I have no reason to disbelieve his account. 
So, yeah, let's talk about the F4 because beautiful plane and a fantastic role that you flew it in. Um, when did you get that call uh, or that get to the office, this is what you're going to fly? How did you feel when you knew you were going to go to F4s? Ah, so I was pumped, but that doesn't happen until you're about to get your wings. Mm -hmm. so that's a couple months prior to getting your wings. We have what's called assignment night, and it's a big deal. You go to the O Club, you know, people drink a lot of alcohol, not me, of course, and they uh, uh, they read out the assignments for the guys, and everybody in that you know soon to be graduating class gets their assignment read out. And yeah, it's a huge deal. And it was an F4G and I was just pumped. That was what I wanted and we're off to the races. Yeah, so before we get into it, so there's no, you don't know at all when that wheel goes round or you don't have any inclination what you're going on to? Not really, although I knew I was going to a fighter. So the way specialized navigator training went is you start out flying core for about 13 weeks and you're, you're, you match your class standing with your dream sheet. Our preference list is called a dream sheet. Yes. And so you put the things you want, and, you know, the number one guy in the class, they try and give that individual the number one thing on their list, and then they start moving down based on what's available at any given time. So to get from core, you decide whether you want to go tanker, transport, bomber, electronic warfare, and fighter. I went electronic warfare. Then you have to recompete in... EW school in order to get near the top to get a fighter mm. and then you're going through the fighter track and you know you're going to go to a fighter right I mean there's it's you know, there was an odd chance that maybe you'd show up at a B1 um, because B1 guys at one point started going to the fighter through the fighter track but then we didn't expect that so you know you're going to a fighter but you don't know till uh, assignment night what's going to drop down because you don't even know what's available the staff doesn't even know what's available was there people who were like oh god i've got that and did they have to like pretend to be like yeah i'm really excited but they really weren't yes um <laughs> yes that happens all the time <laughs> um but you know some of those people will later tell you it's like yeah i didn't really want this airplane but it was the best thing that ever happened uh People learn to like the aircraft they get assigned to pretty much regardless because they got into it to fly. So your short-term disappointment doesn't necessarily turn into long-term career disappointment either. Exactly. So let's get on to the Phantom. So can you actually talk us through the role of the F4G and the Wild Weasel role? So the F4G was the Advanced Wild Weasel, Wild Weasel 5. And in, in easy terms, it's, it's a suppression of enemy air defenses asset. So it is designed to go out, hunt down, and suppress or destroy enemy radar-directed missile systems and guns before they're a threat to somebody else. So it's actually an offensive counter-air role, and it's really a support role because your job is to make sure that everybody else gets in and out of the target area in an air defense environment. Wow, and um, was this role for both pilots and EWO like a, a sought after role? Yes, I, I think it was, um, although maybe you have to be a little strange. So <laughs> when the first guys who did it in Vietnam, I mean, they picked very high end fighter pilots, but there were no fighter EWOs. They came out of bombers. And mm -hmm. so that's why the unofficial motto is YGBSM. And that's that that later grew to you know weasels became largely volunteer and through most of the time frame and certainly the f4g when i got into it you could take baby ewos but mostly it was experienced pilots all right so how did that that tr uh, transition then was it just like a case of right we've got a course and we can take guys who are not pilots now right so um what we did in the transition course, so we all went through F4E school, but mm -hmm. we all know we're going to the weasel school anyway. You know, mm -hmm. guys were going to either the, uh, at that time, it would have been the recce phantoms or uh, to the weasels. And so you're paired up with, with your crewmate, and my crewmate was Dave Lucia, Santa, who is an experienced guy coming out of O37s and OV10s. Mm. So... We had a bunch of EWOs straight out of nav school, but our pilots had all gotten, you know, 300 to 500 hours in tactical aircraft and 
uh, they were a little older than we were. So that's kind of how it matched up at the time the, of the last Weasel classes. Brilliant stuff. So I want to get into some detail here. So can you talk us through the ground training and was the E-model the right aircraft to start training on? Well, so we've kind of skipped a step between nav school. So between nav school and going to show up at the formal training unit, you did what's called lift, lead-in fighter training. Hmm. And that was with AT-38s with a Smurf blue paint job uh, flying down at Holloman. And the syllabus for us is only actually seven sorties. But hmm. you got on the flying schedule wherever there was a back seat. So it's only seven graded sorties, and then you sandbag wherever else you can get a flight. <laughs> yeah. And so that's your first transitional high-speed supersonic jet. That's the first time you're actually going to fly really at 500 feet. And that kind of sets you up for fast jet. And then when you got to the Phantom School, you start out the same as everything else. It's a new airplane. You learn all the emergency procedures. You learn the systems. You go through the simulator. You do your emergency procedures. And then you start flying in that, doing air-to-air -air and uh, intercepts, uh, basic fighter maneuvers, start learning your air-to-ground pieces. And it was the the perfect aircraft to get into a wild weasel because the F-4G is really an F-4E with the gun pulled out and the Loran pulled out and a whole bunch of additional black boxes added where the gun and the ammo drum used to be. And then 52 additional antennas slapped around the outside of the aircraft. Wow, fifth, that many, wow. Yes. So if you look at the F-4G, you see a picture. If you look at the nose when it's exposed, you'll see what looks like a domino. It's like a five spot um, of medium uh, mid-band antennas with a V shape of high band, which are the smaller ones. And so each of those little dominoes is one left, right, and then forward and aft. Those are 10 antenna groups. So that gets you 40 right there. And then more scattered around the airframe. Wow, impressive. But I have to ask you this. Can you remember your first flight in the F-4? And could you feel the power coming from your earlier training aircraft? So I actually do not remember my first flight in wow. the f <laughs> um, I have to say that it must have been awesome. Um, but I don't remember who I flew with or um, when I flew it. I, I just, I can't tell you. But I... I must have been completely blown away because I was there, right? I was now in a Phantom, and it was cool. But I, I strangely enough, I remember my first T-37 rod. I remember my first Strike Eagle rod. I do not remember my first Phantom rod. And, you know, but I do remember I've always, whenever I do the first flight in an aircraft, I always give the pilot a dollar because that is a long-standing tradition. That's why it was called your dollar ride. Dollar ride, yeah. Okay, so you pull a dollar out, you autograph the dollar, you put the date on, and you hand it to your instructor. I mean, I, I even did that uh, the first time I flew the X-Cub for flight test or the Piper Warrior. You know, I gave the uh, the instructors, uh, the instructor pilots a dollar because it's wow. tradition. Yeah, absolutely. So how long did your training on the E last before you actually transitioned onto the G? I think it lasted all, including the ground training, it's about seven to eight months. It's actually because it's it's a, I mean, it's the long course. And, you know, that includes the ground training at the beginning and all that. So probably five to six months of actual flying. And that was all E-model. And then you literally move to the squadron down the same street at the other end of the <laughs> ramp. And you start a new set of academics because now you have additional systems to learn. And you start looking at, at more weapons and you learn about the harm uh, and so on. And so the weasel school is a three to four month school. I mean, it's wow. it's it's a finishing course. But now you're actually flying against the simulators up on the range at uh, Edwards or China Lake or Nellis. Yes, let's get into that. So that must have been like a challenging course because obviously you, you're going through your phantom school and then you've got like another four or five months uh, for the G. Did all the guys or gals maybe at the time, I don't know, um, make it through that um, EWO course? Oh, yeah. So we didn't have, although I will tell you, there is one guy I did fly with among the, the final phantom flyers who probably should have been washed out of the program. And if he hadn't been one of the last people, uh, I think would have been washed out, but we all made it through. Um, really, it was uh, a, most of those guys I managed to follow afterwards, at least for a couple of years, and they were all you know, credible aviators and you know ex largely experienced guys um, who went on to fly other airplanes. 
um, after the F4G as well. So it was their, you know, their first high speed fighter, but not their last. Mm -hmm. And so, no, there was no by the time you get to the weasel school, the chances of a washout are pretty low. Yeah, because I always thought that because I've heard a few stories where you get to that kind of point and then they're like, oh, yeah, you're not good enough. See, that must be soul crushing. But obviously you guys are the best of the best, as it were. So you all made it through. I also I mean, I there. There are definitely guys that wash out in the formal training unit um, and sometimes that they're just they, they're just not a good fit for that particular aircraft. They will often go on to fly another one. OK. Uh, it's just that that you don't that's one of the training it's not a flaw but it, the reality is is you get to do harder and more complex stuff it's possible that somebody who is a good aviator is just not a fit for the aircraft they end up training in mm -hmm. uh, that's relatively rare by the time you get to a finishing school like uh like the weasel school and a washout would have been rare because if somebody should have been washed out they should have been washed out in the transition course just before the weasel school so can you talk us through the cockpit, uh, your cockpit, actually, uh, the back seat, uh, and how it compared to the E? Was there many differences there? Oh, it was huge. So the E had some kind of visibility because your instrument panel, you know, wasn't that high. It came up to, you know, maybe chin level and you could see past the, the ejection seat, you know, right and left side. There are a couple instruments up on the top bar as well, but that's where the canopy bar is anyway you know, and the pilot's ejection handle. So you can see right or left. The G model was completely different. So instruments had to be moved down sideways and up to make room for the APR 47 panel, which was this giant salad plate sized radar warning wow. uh, scope, along with the attack scope and your digital displays and a plan or uh, uh, a pan scope, which shows uh, frequency and amplitude of frequency for the entire frequency range. That's multiple rows stacked wow. on top on each other with all these little spikes sticking up. Um, and you had to make room for that, and you had to move things around here and there. So, uh, yeah, it was much more crowded, and so there was no visibility, but not every Phantom was identical. So some of them had cracks, okay. you know, where you could pass a granola bar or a piddle pack up to the front seat. Wow. The safest way to pass a granola bar sometimes is actually to turn the airplane upside down, take the granola bar and go thwack and just slam it through the slot because otherwise the pilot's trying to reach past his ejection handles. Mm -hmm. It slides on the top of the canopy because you're upside down. It pulls it off the canopy and you bring it up right again. Wow. Yeah, I've seen a few pictures and it does look like a lot going on. But, you know, like when you were going through your training or even on your front line uh, squadron, did you ever think, like, I can't remember this, or did you have, like, you know, the cards to, to memorize everything, or, like, how did that work for yourself? I'm a power memorization guy, um, so it just gets to the point where you have a task, and once you learn where everything is, um, those things are... I need to look here or do this in order to accomplish my task. Right. So you look at all the controls and you look at 247 circuit breakers in the back. You can say, how can you remember all that? Well, I can remember the controls and the indicators, but there are some that I rarely use, right? Like the angle of attack indicator. I kind of watch it. We're on final approach and otherwise I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are the... The, there are just things that you don't necessarily notice. And the circuit breakers, there's one I remember. And that's the air refueling circuit breaker, which is under the second V in valve. It's actually a plate on the side. And uh, there are conditions where you actually do that for normal refueling. But anything else, I'd have to look up. And, you know, there are some emergency procedures where you need to pull a breaker. But so, yeah, so little... not, that was not memorized, and you had to go into a checklist for it. Yeah, absolutely. So what was your first frontline squadron on the G? So I came out of uh, the FTU. I went to Spangdalem, Germany, uh, the 52nd wing, and I was in the 81st fighter squadron. So that was the first frontline squadron. This was right after the first Gulf War. So I show up as a lieutenant in a squadron full of war heroes, um, and I'm just the guy that showed up a little bit later. But we were based in Germany. That was the European... Uh, contribution really we had ef-111s at upper hayford we had the uh, wild weasels at spangdalem and we had the ec-130 co uh, uh, compass call at sembach germany just down the road mm -hmm. 
And how do you feel like your first frontline squadron being in a different country? Were you excited or anything like that? Or were you like, oh, God, I don't want to leave? Oh, no, I was totally excited. I mean, yeah. Uh, uh... You know, I wouldn't. That was the place to be. Spangdalen was definitely the place to be. Um, and the alternatives were pretty low because the other alternative was George Air Force Base, California, where I'd trained, which is in the middle of nowhere. And I was done with George Air Force Base as a place to be about 60 days after I got there. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany was new. It was exciting. And, and more importantly, it had the right atmosphere. So your squadron is hardened. Your airplanes are in hardened shelters. There are base defense bunkers all over the place. There's an army Hawk battery on the base. Wow. Um, you know, this is, this is it, man. You're now an ops guy, you know, on a forward base squadron in Germany. Plus the food's fantastic. There was lots to do. Um, um, I was married at the time. So I went out and, uh, my wife is much better with languages than I am. She already <laughs> spoke French. She learned to speak German. We're close to the French border. Um, so that was handy to, I mean, it was just, we would go places. She was able to put some language skills. Her language skills actually got good enough that the Germans would mistake her as a native German speaker. But they, oh, wow. no matter where we were, they always assumed she was from some other part of the country. Really? Um, yeah, so the... Uh, uh, it was just fun. I mean, when we were there, there were places to go. Um, there was still a good U.S. military presence. And so we did a, the, the actually ended up doing a lot of archery um, because archery demonstrations and teaching Germans and Dutch how to shoot bows and arrows because they had been illegal up until uh, about 1991 <laughs> when the legal codes were consolidated. So it was a Napoleonic era war. You can't have, let peasants have bows and arrows. So it's the stuff started showing up in, uh, uh, in German department stores and nobody knew, it had, knew how to use it except the Americans. So we would regularly, you know, a weekend event might be, we'd go out to teach people using our bows and our arrows to shoot this stuff at a castle. <laughs> and we basically get yes you can set up a tent outside the castle we've got food why don't you come out and teach people to shoot so i mean germany was fantastic that way and yes. i'm a you know i'm a history guy and a castle buff so great place to be yeah so it was perfect for you then uh, which is great <laughs> but uh, yeah let's get back to the g so what kind of weapons could it carry or munitions and did they get upgraded uh, regularly on a regular basis so we had the the G model could carry anything the E model could, mm -hmm. um, but didn't always have all the bits and pieces. So we didn't carry laser guided bombs, not because we couldn't put them on the airplane, but because we didn't carry a designator pod. You know, we thought about it, but uh, the paved spike was the pod we could have fit, and it really wasn't, you know, our thing. It wasn't our mission. Mm -hmm. So we could carry cluster bombs. Um, we could carry a gun pod, but nobody ever would have considered it. It's just too big, heavy, and pointless for our mission. Um, the real, and we've always got air to air missiles, so AIM 9s and AIM 7s. And the key were the anti radiation missiles. So we still had the Vietnam era Shrike mm -hmm. uh, because there had actually been money spent to, to refurbish those sometime earlier in the 80s. The AGM-78 standard, also Vietnam, had gone out of service because of rocket motor cracks, but we had the HARM, the new high-speed anti-radiation missile, and, and that was it. That was the defense suppression machine we wanted. And over time, that got a series of block upgrades. It's essentially still getting block upgrades, both software and hardware. Mm -hmm. So that uh, was really what we saw the big improvements on. And then we also had the Maverick, which is a short range, essentially an anti-tank missile. But mm -hmm. we were we were seeing upgrades trickle. So we had the infrared D. We saw the big warhead G come in, uh, and they were still being trickled into the the aircraft as well. And what would be a, a full layout? Like how many missiles? Um, you know, all that kind of thing, including fuel tanks as well. So we always carried a centerline tank, a high-performance centerline, which is 600 gallons, um, designed for the F-15E, but the Gs could carry them. Oh, okay. And we had two 370-gallon wing tanks on the outboards and two harms on the inboard, two AIM-7s in the aft missile, one in each of the aft missile wells. The right front missile well was empty. The left front missile well had our electronic countermeasures pod. Uh, in Europe, that was an ALQ-131, and in uh, the United States, it was an ALQ-184. So that was our loadout, 
if for shorter range missions, and when I say shorter range, I mean you flew out of Bahrain and you went to Kuwait City, (laughs) download the wing tanks and put up two more harms. So you'd go four harms in a center line. And that was... It, for a short-range mission, it might have happened in Germany had the Russians come over the border. Mm. That might very well have been we were more worried about running out of harms than we were running out of gas. I mean, that's saying something right there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, right. We we could not mount AIM-9s over harms, although the later on the Air National Guard jets could because they got adapter lugs installed and they could wrote themselves permission we could never get permission on the active duty side right. uh, so we never carried aim nines over harms our self-defense was always those two aim sevens in the back wells great stuff so what would you say the strengths and weaknesses of the f4g were strengths first uh two-person crew no question about it um the fact that the crew had gone through the weasel school you have an electronic warfare officer in the back you have the best electronic warfare suite ever placed in a fighter aircraft bar none Wow. Um, it was purpose designed for the mission. You had in the harm, you had an excellent weapon. And a, and a weapon I might point out that is still bagging SAMs and other radars on, a, on an almost daily basis. Weaknesses of the airplane is the, the F4G was the heaviest of the Phantom models, the least aerodynamic of the Phantom models <laughs> because of our tin pod. Um, although at least we had the low smoke engines, so you couldn't see us by you know watching the smoke trail and finding the other end of it. Um, J seventy nine is very reliable, but somewhat thrust limited compared to a modern turbo fan. They were turbo jets, mm-hmm. and we had a relatively high fuel consumption, and so our fuel capacity was probably our single biggest limitation. The radar was garbage. The APQ one twenty might have been great over the water. Um, but it was not that great anytime you had to deal with clutter. So look down, it's not really a look down radar and very manually intensive. Um, visibility was marginal to okay. You know, there were just, believe it or not, we had literally hundreds of pounds of leftover stuff in the airplane that served no function anymore. Oh, really? Like the nuclear weapons delivery timers or wires that had been snipped. Now the maintenance guys told me actually all the excess wiring was great. Because if a wire went bad, they just went to the next one in the bundle ah. and connected that. But it had added a lot of weight over time. Uh, and, of course, the airplane was not, you know, did not turn like an F-16. It turned like an F-4. Um, but it was solid. I mean, it was reliable. And I can say the engines sucked a lot of gas, and they didn't deliver as much thrust as a modern one. But you could throw a bolt down the engine, and it would keep running. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you might not notice it i remember flying a jet a number of times where guys said well there's this weird rumble um that occurs above 94 percent." so what was their solution they didn't advance it above 94 percent. finally we had somebody take a look and a bolt uh screw actually had unscrewed from one of the nose panels and gone down down a whole bunch of blades and it was like yeah there's a rumble above 94 percent. great (laughs) engines that's brilliant uh, but Star Baby, uh, did you ever fly any large exercises with the G? Yeah, so um, one of the first things I did was a green flag. So green flag back in the day was the electronic warfare flag. So when I arrived at Spangdalem in June, it was like August, okay? If you get mission ready in a hurry, you can go to the green flag in August. So I got mission ready in a hurry, went back to Nevada, you know, flew in the green flag. And then while I was in... Uh, in that the German assignment, there were occasionally NATO events called cameos, which are big uh, multinational events that went on at least once a month. And while I was deployed to Saudi Arabia during that time frame, we would often just put together exercises with whoever happened to be around Saudis, Royal Air Force, French Air Force, the Navy, whoever happened to be flying. We'd go because we had no real flight restrictions in Saudi Arabia right after the first Gulf War. We can use any airspace that didn't have somebody else in it. Uh, We didn't have to worry about over the ground. I mean, we weren't flying over cities anyway, but but there's plenty of of nowhere to go out and fly over nowhere. Yeah. And if we wanted to go out and do something against the Navy, we could do something against the Navy over water. I mean, yeah, that's that must be amazing for a crew to do. And did it... uh... I mean, did you fly with other nations? How did they see the Phantom? Did they think, oh, that's the old bit of kit there? Or were they like, wow, that's a Phantom? 
Um, it's a little bit of both. Okay, so everybody thinks the Phantom is cool, even those people that that are glad they're in a more advanced airframe. So, you know, the Eagle guys, nobody in, a, in an F-15, a light gray Eagle, thinks they want to go fly Weasel Phantoms, right? But they still <laughs> yeah. think it's cool. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I've never seen from another aircraft is, of course, you have your 1,000-hour patches. Okay, I've only ever seen Phantom one-hour patches. Really? Okay, so people who just get an incentive rod, or in Saudi Arabia, we traded. So I got a 111 sortie and an EWO, uh, 111 EWO got an F4G sortie. I mean, we would occasionally, the two-seaters would trade guys back and forth so you could check out somebody else's airplane. It's both. You know, people, even people who, who aren't thinking they want to fly your Vietnam-era airplane built in 1969 still know it's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, like, just going back a bit here, Star Baby, so... Obviously, when you were going through your training and everything like that, was the eagle about then when you were because you potentially got posted to an eagle? Oh, so I so from a strike eagle perspective, um, there were strike eagles handed out in my class. But what happened at Mather at the time, and this was 1989, it was really 1990 by the time I got, is that they initially filled the strike eagle with experienced guys. And okay. that's what you do when you stand up a brand new aircraft. The first two guys to come out of nav school were Friels and Mack, two second lieutenant EWOs. And they were the first two guys to come out. And then the word came down, no more EWOs in the Strike Eagle for a while. We just want straight guys for Wizzos. Right, right. So it actually turns out, when we got to my fighter class, the number one guy was Jay DeLong. Um, Jay DeLong and I had been battling neck and neck <laughs> but he was an EWO. And so he's the number one guy. There's a Strike Eagle available. No EWOs and Strike Eagles. He gets a 111. I'm the number two guy. Doesn't matter. F4G, top of my list. Number three guy, Jason Dahlquist, uh, you know, gets a uh, potentially there's a Strike Eagle available. Nope, he's an EWO. And he he right. goes elsewhere. So, you know, it wasn't till the number four guy that a strike eagle was handed out because he was a straight wizzo. The top three dudes in my class were EWOs, so no strike eagles. Right. And then it see. later, yeah, and then later it became um, less of a restriction. The restriction went away, but by that time I was already down at George Air Force Base, you know, where I wanted to be. And, you know, uh, uh, Jason was with me flying F4Gs, and I, I'd be surprised if he would have traded. You know, once he got down there and realized this mission is just unbelievably cool. And it's a huge, I mean, this is a complex, you know, really gutsy mission that you have to be good at. And it is really important. It's hard to beat. Yeah, I can imagine. But did you ever take the G into combat? Yes. So I've got about 80 some odd combat missions in the in the G model all over Iraq. And those were both the northern and the southern no-fly zones. But in all that time, I never fired a harm because we were patrolling the no-fly zones and uh, we rarely saw Iraqi radars at the time. And the one time I was really going for a harm shot was when we had a, a, a radar come up and it gave us what we call track bars. So the F4G had a special feature where it would put a cross around a guy on your scope if it thought that that guy was tracking you. Mm. And we get an eye for India Band Unknown. A lot of threats live in the India Band. Um, and it's got track bars. And that's it. That's definitely a problem. And I say, um, and Dennis Malfer in the front seat goes, I got it. And the next thing you know, we're in a 4G <laughs> slicing right turn to put the nose on. Wow. Because we both know what's happening without communicating. And what's about to happen is he's going to roll the nose within 30 degrees. He's going to roll out and I'm going to let the radar have it. And that radar goes down, and I never see it again, like on any other mission ever. Really? Uh, because from his point of view, he locks up an airplane. The airplane immediately executes a turn to put the nose on. And the guy says, up, oh, done. Done, And yeah. goes for a long walk. Yeah, so sticking on, like, flying over there, like, how did you feel? Were you excited or nervous, like, potentially, you know, firing in anger, as it were? Um... I was I was mostly bored. I was not nervous okay. <laughs> um, because because of the guys that fought in the Gulf War. We had very high confidence on the system. 
you know, we were gaining experience because as the last guy, I didn't have lieutenants coming in behind me. I mean, I was one of the last guys to graduate from the, it was the last weasel school class. So we didn't have young guys really coming in after us. And mm -hmm. so the experience level of the squadron was, they were just constantly climbing. And as we got better and better, and, you know, we were the most experienced fighter squad in the Air Force. So that's a confidence builder. The, the no-fly zone is mostly extreme boredom. And when something exciting happens, like I remember there was a guy coming out of Kiara West, Brian Baxley and I, had committed on him because we were the closest fighters. So we were closer than the Eagles. So if the guy had crossed the line, we were going to steal the kill mm -hmm. because we have air-to-air -air missiles too. But the, 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 the Iraqi pilot just kind of danced with us, gave us the big finger, and then turned left and didn't cross the line. But those kind of things really kick up your excitement level. Um, or if you're supporting, you know, sometimes we would uh, provide overhead cover for operations that were going on in northern Iraq um, to support Kurdish forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and to prevent the Iraqis from encroaching on Kurdish territory. So there were still things going on, but most of the time it was just boring. Well, when you say boring, like you're obviously still in a fighter jet, but so what do you, what do you talk about? Do you talk to your front seat? They're like, um, oh yeah, did you see the, the game last night? Or what, what, what conversation goes on between you and your pilot? Oh, well, it's funny. So I'm, I've been told by many a pilot that I am the world's quietest EWO. <laughs> okay, both in the D model and the strike kegel i do not chit chat um mm -hmm. normally when we took off i would actually reprogram the apr 47 the parts that were user reprogrammable so that i knew exactly what was in my scan tables and i had tailored them to the way i wanted it to work and i had adjusted the harm logic to the way i wanted it to perform if one came off the rail while the pilot's doing the crossword puzzle because we would get our our Intel pack and the Stars and Stripes magazine has the, the New York Times crossword puzzle in it every day. So the Intel guys would pack it up and our Intel pack would have, you know, code words and authentication codes and maps and all that, but it would also have the New York Times crossword puzzle. So on the way to the tanker, the guy's doing that. I'm reprogramming my APR 47. There's not a lot of chat. And when I'm actually over, we're, the EWOs are listening to the signals. We're listening to the radar environment, so we're, there's, I'm not encouraging any chit chat uh, <laughs> among it. So golf games, all that can wait until we get back on the ground. I'm I'm ridiculously quiet. <laughs> That's great stuff. So uh, as we move on here, when did the F-16s come in, and did you work with them, or were they essentially to take over your role? So there were actually two stages. Um, so the F-4Gs, only 116 of them were built, and that was not necessarily enough. So we used to practice F-4G, F-4E integration, where the E model would carry shrikes and the G model would carry harms, and the E model would shoot where and when the G told them to. And we had whole procedures. We trained that in the weasel school, you know, mm -hmm. how, to, how to direct a, another uh, shot. That also technique works if you're Wingman's APR-47 is not working right, you can still direct missiles off their aircraft. Mm -hmm. It won't be as good as a shot from yours, um, but they won't be utterly worthless. So the F-16s, as they replaced the F-4s, the F-16s first came on with strikes, that was before my time, and then harms. And so at Spangdalem, while I wasn't in a mixed squadron, um, there, there, you, we would fly with F-16 guys. I've flown combat missions over northern Iraq where the F-16 would actually load up with cluster bombs and aim nines and we'd have aim sevens and harms and so that way we had a full mix and they would do what we largely told them to do but we could direct shots for harms then the f-16s around 1995 we got the whiff that the harm targeting system was going to come out and that the f-16 was going to replace the f-4 although it was always pitched as an interim solution right. while the next weasel was built well that never happened uh, peace dividend killed the follow-on wild weasel and said you ended up with f-16 mild weasels with a harm targeting system hmm so do you think in your personal opinion the f-16 was the right uh, aircraft to take over there the f-4g's no it was absolutely the wrong aircraft but it was the wow. aircraft that was available the logical f-15g would have been uh the well the logical follow-on would have been the f-15g and uh, that was what everybody expected to be the next wild weasel. McDonnell Douglas had a program called Headhunter, 
um, where they had worked out all the sensor placement, where the antennas were going and so on. In fact, Boeing still has plans uh, on how they take an F-15 EX now and mm -hmm. modify some of the equipment from the Growler and turn it into a Weasel. That was I'm, the obvious choice. Long range, heavy payload, two seats. Yeah, two. I was just going to say, yeah, two seats there. Do you think the, the single seat kind of uh, makes it a more difficult mission for the F-16? It does make it a more difficult uh, mission because it puts a lot of stuff on the guy. It puts a lot of tasking on the pilot while at the same time not giving the pilot the tools. So the pilot mm -hmm. is not an EWO. They have not gone to EWO school. They have not gone to a weasel school. And it's not their primary mission. So it's not a case of the F-16 guys not being good um, with the tools that they have. They are good with the tools that they have. It's that the tools are limited and their training um, was essentially shorted by the Air Force. They did not get uh, the benefit of all the training that uh, your F-4G guys got. And just as a side note here, Star Baby, how did you uh, interact with the F-16 guys as you as a backseater? Was there any conflict there? Did, you know, like, were you like, oh, you're, you know, you need, you need a backseater? How did that uh, that interaction work? I am a center of F anti-F-16 conflict. <laughs> uh, Brilliant. Uh, and so I was, um, there is a letter that can be looked up. It's called the F-4 of the 1990s, in which a weapons school instructor, Captain Eric Best, wrote an article in a Navy publication that said that the F-16 was the F-4 of the 1990s. I'm in the weapons shop and I'm reading the Navy pub and I see a guy write this and it's like, oh, that's not going to stand. So I wrote a letter <laughs> called the F-4 of the 1990s, which you can find. Right. Uh, and any version that has profanity in it is not my version. Uh, but it's out there and... Uh, we, everybody in the squadron, except for, for, um, one guy, except for one pilot signed it and we handed it to Eric Best. He came over to the bar. He apologized. We never heard of it again, except that the McDonnell Douglas guys had a fax machine. Hmm. So in one of the earliest cases, I know of something going viral is that they faxed it to every McDonnell Douglas office. They had a fax number four. And just for good measure to every General Dynamics office, the guys that made the F-16, yeah. that they had a number four. So, yes, I was the center of anti-F-16 anger and resentment. And to some extent, I maintain that uh, that facade there is I'm always slamming on the F-16s, despite the fact, you know, that the airplane is improved. The air crews are solid guys, you know. Uh, they've really done well. They're totally reliable, you know, totally worthwhile in combat. I'm not going to admit that. <laughs> Absolutely love that. But a few more questions here uh, while we wrap up the F4 part here, Star Baby. So uh, do you have any scary moments from your time uh, in the Phantom? Oh, yeah. So I've got a couple. So the first is, you know, when flying in Saudi Arabia, um, <laughs> there is... Uh, it's a learning experience, right? And so one of the things I learned was about fuel. So I had a, a momentary scary moment where we landed under emergency fuel conditions. You know, really we were not in any threat. We were close to the base. I wanted to declare emergency fuel. The pilot didn't. We landed with, you know, enough gas to fly for another couple of minutes. So we were okay. But the other time was, um, and it was the same, it was a later deployment actually. It was the next deployment over. We're over Iraq and our wing tanks, our internal wing tanks decide not to feed. Hmm. And because the the way the gas gauge went on the F-4, it did not totalize all your external wing tanks or, or even all your internal fuel. Um, and so it was, it was a delay before you re would realize that all that 4,000 pounds of fuel is trapped. We're over Iraq. We suddenly realized, Kevin Dunchy and I, we have, we have four thousand pounds of trapped fuel we don't have enough to make a friendly air base i mean there's it's not even close there's no jettison go to max endurance profile that's not there we're not going to make it to a base mm -hmm. and but we can make it across either this pretty much the saudi border and at least eject in friendly territory mm -hmm. but a tanker comes to get us and uh they come into iraq 
top us off and we make it all the way back to Dauron. So thank you, tanker guys. <laughs> and the problem with a fuel thing, a uh, fuel problem is that you have plenty of time to realize how totally screwed you are. It's a slow <laughs> developing emergency. Um, it's not like it's suddenly it, it, like your engine catches fire. You don't have a lot of time to contemplate that. You run through the, mm -hmm. the checklist pretty darn quickly. And the other notable time is Dave Lucian and I. So uh, FCF is a functional check flight. And in the F4, you did a functional check flight on an airplane. If you did an engine change or you re-rigged the flight controls or a number of other conditions, and a special FCF crew goes up and flies a profile, which is a great profile because you have to check everything. You have to do a max performance climb. Mm -hmm. You have to go supersonic um, to check how the ramps, the intake ramps program. I mean, it, you run through all the processes. And some guys tell us that this airplane is flying funny. Well, the chief FCF pilot can FCF any airplane at any time for any reason. So he grabs me, he says, Star Baby, we're going to go FCF this airplane. And we go, and we're going to check it. And we're at 15,000 feet. Uh, no, actually, I take that back. We're at uh, 21,000 feet over Nellis Range, which has a 5,000-foot elevation. It's kind of high. Mm-hmm. And part of the check involves pulling back on the stick, jacking up the AOA, and watching the slats on the leading edge of the wings program out. Because when you reach a certain angle of attack, the slats program out, they mm -hmm. change the shape of the wing, and that means you can go to more angle of attack. That was, that was the slats were added to the e, late E models, and all the Gs had them. So we could, our wing would not stall at higher angle of attacks like a hard wing. And he pulls back on the stick, and we go to the point where the slats should have programmed, and the jet departs controlled flight. Oh, no. It snap pulls, and it's out of control. Wow. And the, the bold face for that is um, stick full forward, and that's the first action you take. And Dave goes stick full forward, and the aircraft immediately recovers. And you can hear two deep breaths, and he goes, did I scare you? <laughs> and I go, no, but I checked the altimeter. And he says, good man, let's go home. What I had done in that fraction of a second when we are not in control is I had done the mental math and that we had to eject uncontrolled at 10,000 feet above the, the grounds. So that means at 15,000 feet, we're at 21,000 feet. I've got yeah. 6,000 feet. To, when the clock hits 15, we're gone. That's, that is what we'd all done. Decisions made. I'm just doing the math. And, and Santa up front knows that. And we land the aircraft and the, the flight controls in the tail, the stab had been misrigged. Part of the left side was connected to the right and part of the right side was connected to the left. Mm. If somebody had pulled high AOA on a 4G turn at a low level, um, they'd have likely departed the aircraft and spun it into the ground before they could have recovered. Wow, so I, I guess you kind of saved lives in terms of checking that aircraft at that height. Yeah, I mean, and that's uh, well, that's part of the profile is when you're going to do the checks, you're going to do it at an, at an altitude where even if you can't recover, you can at least get out. Yeah, absolutely. So do you have a favorite moment uh, from your time in the Phantom? Oh, wow. Um, from, you know, for actually flying the airplane or, you know, favorite moments. This is weird. Um, low level is just fun. A low level in northern Iraq, I think, was an enormous amount of fun. But my all-time favorite moment was another functional check flight where the service ceiling of the Phantom is 60,000 feet, but the statutory limit is 50,000 because we're not wearing pressure suits. Mm -hmm. And so if you lose cabin pressurization above 50,000, that's bad. So our statutory, our regulatory limit is 50,000 feet. <clears throat> and so when you're doing the supersonic profile, one of the ways to dump off your airspeed when you reach your Mach 1.55, before you run out of supersonic approved airspace and bust into a jetway, <laughs> is to jack the nose up. So you're making the run at like 42 or 44,000 feet. You've got 6,000 feet to jack the nose. And so absolute favorite is we're at the top of our arc, Altimeter's reading 50,000 feet. I'm looking out, and at that altitude, you can see the curvature of the Earth, and you can see the sky fade from blue to black. Mm. That is absolutely my favorite Phantom moment. Did you take up a camera uh, for that uh, that mission or that sortie? No, um, even if I had, I'd have forgotten it. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Fair um, enough. I, I, I have very few pictures of my Phantom Time, and half of them were taken by somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Because I, even though I carried uh, a disposable camera or even an Instamatic in many cases, I was usually focused enough that I never thought of getting it out. And the times when you want to get it out are probably the times when you're busy and shouldn't have it out. Yeah, I've heard that on many occasions. Like, why didn't I bring a camera? But yeah, I'll be busy for the, the photos I actually want to take. So I've heard that a few times, Star Baby. But uh, we're going to wrap up the Phantom part here. But uh, how many hours did you get on it? 1,010.1. I am the last American to get 1,000 hours operationally in the Mighty Phantom 2. And McDonnell Douglas, everybody else has a printed you know, thousand hour old guy, you know, drawn dude in a helmet for their thousand hour hour certificate. I have from McDonald Douglas a thousand hour certificate that is a phantom in afterburner taking off into the sunset. Oh wow. It's different than anybody else's and it's the last one issued in American. That's absolutely brilliant. But I'm guessing overall you enjoy your time on the Phantom. I loved it. I would not I mean I would have stayed with it as long as it stayed operationally. And as cool as the Strike Eagle turned out to be, and as much fun as I had in the Strike Eagle, Weasel Phantoms were it. That was absolutely my favorite mission. I would have taken an upgraded Phantom. All I really wanted with a Phantom was a new radar. Um, and, well, some air conditioning would have been nice. 